Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Happy lunchtime, depending on where you are. My name is Wendy Kadge. I'm on the faculty at Brandeis University. And on behalf of the Chaplaincy Innovation Lab community, I'm really thrilled to welcome you to our Tuesday at noon, at least in Boston, Town Hall. Uh, I'm thrilled today to welcome three of our colleagues who are going to talk a bit with us about their experiences during these days. My kids are busting into the room. Um, <laughs> and give us some support and feedback and encouragement as we continue to uh, work through uh, what is certainly an unusual time. Uh, we are recording this webinar, so uh, just let, let you know that and let your colleagues know they can watch it later if they'd like. You can use the, the chat function to um, talk with one another. It, it's easier and more helpful for us if you use the question box for questions because then we can keep track of them. Uh, we have lots of resources on the Chaplaincy Innovation uh, Chaplaincy Innovation Labs website, which got a, a remake this week, which we were obviously doing long before all of this happened. So we'll chat out some resources. And uh, we're collaborating with the ACPE and other organizations right now to gather uh, chaplains who are in positions to be able to volunteer. We're getting some requests, particularly from healthcare organizations in New York City and other places that could really use support for staff, especially and potentially for patients and families uh, as their resources are dwindling. So if you're in a position to be able to provide some telechaplaincy either by Zoom or by phone, uh, we will chat out the link shortly where you can, um, where you can volunteer. Okay, so on with it. Uh, thanks first to Storm Swain, who is an Associate Professor of Pastoral Care and Theology at United Lutheran Seminary. She was a chaplain during 9-11 and has done research on disaster spiritual care, so she's going to share a few words first, followed by Munir Sheikh, who is the Vice President of Operations and Academic Affairs at Bayan Islamic Graduate School, and then James Weathersby, who is a chaplain at Riverview Psychiatric Center in Maine, will share a few words. And we will then spend most of our time responding and in conversation around your questions. Uh, Trace Hawthorne, the CEO of the ACPE, will help facilitate questions if his power goes back on, which has just gone out. Otherwise, it'll be me. So, Storm, let's start with you, and thanks again to all of you for being with us. Thank, Thank you, you for inviting me. Uh, just if I can get a thumbs up that you can hear me well enough. That's great. Um, I just want to say that I was a former general hospital and then psychiatric chaplain and CPE supervisor in New Zealand so uh, when I come back to chaplaincy it feels like I'm coming back to um, my spiritual home in many ways. I was asked today um, because I had been involved as a, a chaplain with 9-11 uh, and working initially in the family assistance centres and then uh, at the disaster mortuary and uh, the respite, one of the respite centres for uh, part of the time and then went on to do research on the chaplains that worked at the temporary morgue at Ground Zero. And I've been thinking about this, um, uh, some of the similarities and differences between these two disasters. And I think uh, both of these those things are important. We were told at 9-11 what happened with Oklahoma City would be what happened with us uh, in New York uh, after 9-11. And it was a very different picture. And so each disaster, of course, is, is its own thing. But I think the, the key thing I want to say um, about the COVID-19 response compared to 9-11 is this, and, and I'm really happy to be proved wrong, but I think a 9-11 disaster, res disaster response, the main risk to chaplains and those working in the disaster was PTSD. And for COVID-19, I think the main risk to chaplains, clergy, and those working in the disaster is actually burnout. We asked uh, our students recently um, what was the most helpful thing that they learned at seminary that had resourced them at this time. And a number of them cited the disaster spiritual care course they took and noted that what stuck with them was the phrase, it's a marathon and not a sprint. And really that sense of this long response that we are called into. And then they cited the life cycle of a disaster model, which I'm sure uh, most everybody here on this call knows, um, declining my political call there. Um, 
and uh, I think the model was shared by the American Red Cross and it was picked up by Myers and We in Disaster Mental Health. But of course we know that this model has phases going from impact rescue through aftermath relief, short-term recovery, long-term recovery and reconstruction. And it also shows those emotional phases of the disaster which go from that altruistic heroic phase to the honeymoon phase where there is significant community cohesion through a time of disillusionment, through to a time where you work through the grief, come to terms with the changes, adjust and accept. I think the Institute for Collective Trauma and Growth quite helpfully calls these last phases rebuilding and restoration and a wiser living phase. But I think we know that the problem with the COVID-19 pandemic is that the impact rescue phase is elongated. And I've found myself thinking that it's like the uh, earthquakes in Christchurch, New Zealand. And if you're trying to work out where I come from originally, I'm a Kiwi, this is a New Zealand accent. Um, but it, it, in the earthquakes in Christchurch, New Zealand, it wasn't just one earthquake or even three big ones several months apart. It was living with the ongoing reality of almost continual aftershocks that kept your adrenal glands and your home, hormonal response on the edge of fight, flight, freeze much of the time. So with this, I think one of the challenges for us is, you know, when is the impact of this disaster over? When can we even say that we've come to a phase of aftermath? We, we don't know yet. Uh, one of the extraordinary <coughs> pieces of research that came out of 9-11 was done by Stefan Roberts and the team at Healthcare Chaplaincy whose research department I have a, an incredible amount of respect for. And at a conference following the disaster, they did research on chaplains and other clergy because they hypothesized, along with current research, that those at a closer proximity to the disaster with a longer duration of service, greater exposure to morbid material, would be those most likely to manifest the cluster of symptoms that is PTSD. However, they found that those that worked for the American Red Cross alone, which included chaplains at the temporary mortuary down at Ground Zero, the disaster mortuary, the respite centres, as well as the family assistance centres, those chaplains came out of the disaster less traumatised than clergy who had not responded at all. So let me repeat that. Those chaplains that worked at those difficult um, places where they were closest to the disaster, working with morbid material alongside first responders who were often looking for those that they knew and loved, came out of the disaster less traumatised than clergy who had not responded at all. Those that came out most traumatised were those that who had overdeployed. They may have worked for the American Red Cross, like the aforementioned group. They may have also been working in their hospital or congregation, but they were also volunteering in other ways, perhaps providing chaplaincy to one of the companies or serving at a respite centre like St Paul's or multiple um, instances of engagement. Whereas the chaplains who took one shift a week, longer or shorter, depending on where you worked, had some post-shift defusing, had a sense of mission and agency, found a supportive community in the place of deployment and knew how to leave, tended to do better. So we know that compassion satisfaction mitigates against secondary traumatic stress. And I think we saw that in the 9-11 chaplains that felt privileged to be able to respond. But I think that brings us to the significant differences with COVID-19. How do you leave this disaster? And for those of you that are hospital chaplains, how do you go home and let it go? Because it's still there when you go home. Um, most of us are in some kind of social isolation 
or lockdown. And those complexities, um, particularly in uh, hospitals, where is the case? How do you provide a ministry of presence when you can't be physically present? And I think we are all finding ways to do that in new and adaptive ways. But I think uh, the, the sense of um, uh, agency is has to be renegotiated in the midst of this. How do we find ways to engage uh, embodied, disembodied uh, that are helpful? And uh, I, I might say something a little later about um, particularly helpful embodied coping practices. Uh, but I think this is the, our major challenge, not just how to be uh, to offer a ministry of presence when we're not present, but how to uh, to keep going uh, without burning ourselves out, particularly when we are responding in multiple contexts and our families are not disconnected from this, where we're a sense of we can't get away from this disaster. So particularly for those that are uh, losing sleep, uh, particularly thinking about particular people or persons or or contexts in which you're ministering, um, those that feel trapped within the work, um, those of us that are feeling exhausted, maybe overwhelmed by the amount of work, bogged down by the system or the system isn't facilitating uh, a sense of agency and presence at the moment and those that are unduly sensitive in, in physical or uh, psychological ways, those uh, of us have that higher risk towards burnout, which we really need to look at mitigating in this marathon of a disaster response. So perhaps I will uh, pause there and, and uh, give it over to Michael and then perhaps cycle back to, to talk about embodied coping practices and, and see what are some ways that we are managing that. Uh, uh, sorry, not Michael, Munir, can I uh, uh, hand over to you? Sure, thank you. Thank you, Storm. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, Good day to everyone. Uh, I think today's March 97th, uh, if I can keep track. Um, certainly feels that uh, time is stretching in unusual ways. I thought I'd take uh, today's uh, opportunity to just to share a little bit about our institutional response and uh, some uh, of the broader Muslim community response nationwide. Um, at Bayan here, we're in uh, part of the Claremont School of Theology, and so we have a campus-wide chapel service that happens every Tuesday, and now, of course, it's conducted virtually. I think some of the things I'll be mentioning are, are things that have been implemented uh, in seminaries and, and schools context generally uh, pretty widely now. But we do have this chapel service, and each week uh, a different faith tradition leader will usually lead the service and uh, offer some words of encouragement and, and support. Uh, our particular academic program is a low residency program. Uh, so typically our students uh, come from all over the country, and they come uh, to campus one week uh, in person uh, for an intensive. Of course, we had to cancel our face-to-face -face portion and make everything virtual. Um, and that was scheduled right at the cusp of when, when this outbreak uh, started to get really serious. So we canceled that, converted everything to uh, online. Fortunately, we already had a pretty good infrastructure for that in place because we had been doing this kind of hybrid model for about five years now, which in, included the, the online component. Uh, so all the work workflows for uh, preparing the links and sending out all the information to the respective students in each course, all of that went pretty well. Um, so our faculty and students were able to adjust. I know different institutions have had different levels of uh, difficulty or challenge with respect to uh, that conversion process. Across the board, uh, in terms of assignments for courses, of course, you know we've encouraged all of our faculty re to relax the due dates and cut some of the scope of the assignments. Uh, presently, we thought we should continue to maintain the structure in terms of there being some kind of posted due dates, just targets uh, to be uh, strived for, but uh, certainly not going to be um, handled in a, as stringent a fashion as uh, we might ordinarily. Uh, so we've been communicating that students should you know, just 
try to get the work done uh, to the best of their ability uh, when they can. Um, we've been uh, initiating some virtual office hours as well, um, making sure to validate students' feelings of anxiety, expressing empathy rather than sort of a blithe optimism that things are just going to get be better in another month or two. Um, and uh, we want to encourage them to, you know, do other things besides their schoolwork. Um, they've already been doing other things, of course. Many of them are working or they're, you know, they have families to attend to, but we, we want to certainly support, you know, their family time and uh, their mental health, you know, by um, exercise and other kinds of things, uh, mindfulness activities, prayer. Uh, on the staff side, you know, we mostly work from home. We, we might come in to get some mail or something like that. But uh, we've been doing our weekly staff meetings online, so that continues. <clears throat> but I think everyone's feeling a sense of some anticipatory grief. Um, I think there's a precaution, you know, because we've come to learn uh, that, you know, almost anybody's at risk uh, uh, to suffer from this particular virus. It's not just a certain demographic as we initially thought. Um, and maybe statistically that's still true, but I think we've seen enough cases where uh, those who we would not expect to be seriously compromised do do get ill and uh, in some cases pass away. So I think that's that's in the back of, of a lot of people's minds. Uh, in terms of the Muslim community over, overall, um, in Southern California, there's a body called the Shura Council, which is a kind of consultative body. There are a number of Shura councils nationwide in some of the larger metropolitan areas, Chicago, Atlanta, um, I'm sure in Texas and other places. I believe Houston. Um, and so the Shura Council has been sending out advisories. Uh, one of the first advisories was, you know, uh, following the CDC guidelines in terms of social distancing and hygienic practices and things like that. So they were pretty on top of that, I would say, and uh, very early on also strongly recommended that every mosque uh, cancel Friday prayers and even daily prayers. Uh, and that happened pretty well. I think there was a lot of uh, conformity. There were a few, two or three mosques, I think, in the first week, maybe two, three weeks ago, that did not uh, comply with that recommendation. But, of course, the, the governmental um, uh, stipulations have also reinforced uh, that encouragement. So now it's, it's not really a choice. that uh, It's something that they must do to comply. Uh, so far, no one's been arrested, at least uh, in the Muslim community, as far as I know, for keeping a mosque open. Um, I would say that there's been a lot of collaboration between religious scholars, imams, uh, physicians in the Muslim community, as well as public health experts in the community. So they're all consulting with each other and uh, trying to provide a consistent message uh, to the various mosque communities at large. Uh, all of the same uh, guidelines about social distancing and the symptoms of COVID and sanitizing practices, all of these things are being sent out via newsletter and on websites. So I think uh, there's a fair amount of saturation within the Muslim community in terms of how serious this is and how everyone needs to take, you know, play their role in the flattening the curve and, and things of that nature. Uh, so that's been happening. Now, as of this week, I see uh, a move into sort of dealing with the financial uh, implications of this uh, pandemic. Uh, so now a lot of the messaging is around how to sustain organizations and mosques since they're not collecting donations every Friday uh, by, by congregants. Uh, so digital donations, um, supporting particular uh, families or individuals in need, uh, and looking into some of the new loans and grants that are available. Uh, for pande pandemic assistance uh, with the legislation that was passed last week. Uh, a lot of the Friday sermons that would have been given in person, of course, are now being offered virtually. The prayer is not happening in congregation. Uh, families are praying in their own homes, typically. Uh, and uh, there are other educational talks and religious sermons that are given on a daily basis, in the evenings, or on a weekly basis. And these are for different age groups. So uh, the leadership is mindful of the needs of, you know, young people, uh, kids, as well as uh, older adults. So uh, we're seeing a lot of that um, utilization of Facebook Live and Zoom and other platforms to reach the community and, and give them something 
uh, uplifting and um, to help them center and help them uh, really sort of um, ride this through uh, and and reflect on you know um, the, the kinds of theological questions that we're always thinking about in in theological education you know the um, uh, God's will and our agency and things of that nature. I think there's a lot more appreciation for the role of chaplains and mental health professionals uh, within the community. Uh, so I think that's been a silver lining. Uh, I think uh, down the line, uh, those functions will become more commonplace and more uh, expected within the Muslim community. So people will be able to seek out assistance in an appropriate way with the appropriate professionals. Uh, I think this uh, particular crisis is uh, stimulating that sort of uh, consideration. Uh, and I think that uh, people are uh, talking about a new kind of steady state after this comes to a close, at least this particular crisis. So not necessarily a return to normal. Sometimes we think about that. I think in, you know, in the early period, people were talking about getting this out of the way as soon as possible and returning to business as usual, but uh, hopefully we'll all be a bit more mindful of how we can allocate our resources, invest in uh, preparing for future situations so that we won't be trying to play catch up as we've been doing the last several weeks uh, in terms of some of the PPE and other kinds of resources that we've been talking about. I'll just close with a couple of poems that uh, came across my desk recently. One is um, actually by a historical figure, a Persian um, poet named Saadi, and his poem poem is called Bani Adam, which means um, the children of Adam. And it's very brief, it's, uh, I'll read it. Human beings are members of a whole in creation of one essence and soul. If one member is afflicted with pain, other members uneasy will remain. If you have no sympathy for human pain, the name of human you cannot retain. And uh, the concluding poem is by a contemporary Palestinian-American poet, Zaina Azam. She recently published this poem. What I want to say to the tulips that emerged again in March. I am so grateful to count on you. There is nothing else to gird me anymore. This beauty almost makes me weep. Do you see how different the world is now? And they tell me, no, as we know it, the world is still the same. The rains arrived this morning. The nightingale keeps working so hard to sing. The starling wails. If sickness comes, I want to be like the wise tulips, store energy in my heart bulb, and come back after a hard winter, dressed in bright turbans of orange and yellow and red. Thank you all. We'll pass it on to uh, to our next speaker. All right, James, can you hear us? I hope we haven't lost James Weathersby there. James was with us just by audio. Why don't we take a question or two, Michael, while you try to track them down? Would that be okay? Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, so folks, if you have questions, please put them in the box. We've got a couple coming in. Um, I wondered to start Storm and Munir. Um, a lot of the kind of early fixes that are being implemented are technical changes. And there are some thinkers and uh, you know uh, practitioners who talk about adaptive versus technical kind of change. And I wonder, given that we're seeing a lot of the technical fixes, if you have thoughts about the kinds of adaptive changes that you see as important to sort of address and support our communities in the new reality that we're with or in at the moment. Thoughts on that about adaptive changes? Well, I think one of the biggest uh, things that I've noticed is sort of obviously the, the lines between, quote, work life and home life of school life have all been blurred. And um, in some ways that's a huge challenge because sometimes people need structure, they need their, their, their daily schedule. Um, but I think it's a good thing in the sense that it enables us to see 
that we're all human and we're all dealing with a variety of things and we can be empowered to uh, work out a balance for ourselves. And I think that the ad adaptation is that we can all kind of get a glimpse of that. We get a glimpse into each other's lives and we, we um, identify with that. And um, I think that going forward, uh, hopefully we'll all be a little bit more uh, charitable, a little bit more merciful, a little bit more accommodating of, of one another. Because I think, you know, we will hopefully understand that we're all trying uh, to reach some positive outcome. We're all striving for improvement, uh, for bettering our own lives and those of, of those around us. And if we can keep that big picture in mind, I think that that's a huge shift potentially for, for humanity as a whole. You're on mute. I am on mute, thank you. I think for me, both as an educator, uh, but also uh, as a chaplain, um, it's about adapting to doing things differently uh, and doing things in a way that uh, perhaps in common circumstances you would choose not to do. So I, I said that I would never teach um, pastoral theology as a one week intensive. And two weeks ago, I did exactly that because I needed to uh, and gathered with this group of uh, 22 students online and, and just worked out how I could do this in not just the best way possible, but in a way that um, facilitated a kind of engagement um, that was a gift rather than a burden at the time. Um, and once I had f figured out breakout rooms on Zoom and all those kind of things, um, it worked a lot better. But I, but I think in chaplaincy, just adapting to um, how do we, you know, offer this ministry of presence in a di when we aren't embodied in the same physical place, and and you know, going back to the telephone, but also using. Um, Zoom or FaceTime or WhatsApp or connecting with others in this way and um, uh, seeing that as um, you know giving up the uh, doing things in the same way we did before and and taking on what can we do in this circumstance um, so again that kind of problem solving approach and and I, you know I think some of us um, have really enjoyed some of those means of connecting with others uh, that have been a gift uh, at this time. I think one of the other things uh, about being adaptive is giving up the plan of how you're going to do it when it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in my own home community, um, the the church, we produced online worship for Sunday morning and the amount of time it would take to film that and edit that and upload that, and it didn't work. Um, the, the uploading took like, hours and hours and hours and some button wasn't clicked and it wouldn't upload to YouTube and so um, at six o'clock in the morning my uh, spouse who is also an Episcopal priest and I were in the church recording audio morning prayer for the eight o'clock service that we got uploaded at 7.58 you know and so we've all got examples like that of being adaptive in that way um, and I think you know, coming back to one of Donald Winnicott's terms, being the good enough chaplain or the good enough um, caregiver at the time and, and in that way. And also adapting to when, you know, you've got this brilliant video going and the dog barks or the kid comes in or, you know, it's not the perfect um, uh, thing that you would uh, want to do. But also adapting to the reality of how, how do we respond in this disaster. Uh, in our, with our local hospital, uh, chaplains, uh, because uh, chaplaincy has been relatively newly engaged and it's a volunteer chaplaincy, chaplains are not seen as essential services within the hospital uh, and a lot of hospital staff have been sent home. So uh, chaplains are able to offer chaplaincy response by disembodied means. Uh, but one of the things we looked at was that 
you know, coming from 9-11, when I was um, one of the chaplains at the disaster mortuary, what I noticed was a really helpful practice is that workers, when they were taking a, a break off the shift, would come into the chaplain's tent, not necessarily to talk to the chaplain, but to look at the pictures and letters from kids all around the country that said, you know, we're there with you, we're praying for you, thank you for what we're doing. And, you know, those great kids' pictures of the planes going into the towers and, you know, working through uh, the disaster in picture. And and reading those letters and seeing those pictures, that kind of visual symbolic sense of the community embracing those that were working the disaster was really, really important. So we had this idea about what would it be like if we paper the chapel at the hospital with those kind of things from our community, letters and pictures from kids. Um, but the hospital's not even receiving mail at the moment. Uh, so we have worked out that uh, what we need to do is to get a dedicated printer that everything, pictures get scanned and uploaded and printed out on the one printer, that the one person takes it and uh, puts it up in the chapel. And we're working through uh, the permission issues of whether that's one of the chaplains themselves uh, and if we do that, then even though there would be no person-to-person -person contact, we would still need uh, personal protection equipment to go into the hospital and do that. Or whether there is somebody in the hospital in the chain of command that would be willing to do that also. Uh, but looking for those kind of symbolic embodied ways of offering presence, as well as the personal one-to-one -one sense. Thank you. That's really helpful. James, I think we found you. Yes. Yes. Are, am I there? You're here. Share a few words with us if you okay. don't Okay. Absolutely. First of all, Brother Manir, salam. Good to see you, sir. And do storm hello again. Um, I have been, um, as I said, I'm the chaplain with a the um, state of Maine Department of Health and Human Services um, forensic facility. I've been here 12 years. Uh, we had, we are, t and unfortunately or fortunately, like, uh, unlike everyone else, we are totally enclosed. So our patients are here. And once our staff are here, they are here through the, their entire shift. So we literally have this um, kind of a duality. We have people who cannot leave and the people who come in who are worried about leaving. And the facility and our commissioner are, uh, who are continually getting updates from CDC Maine as well as CDCP in Atlanta, sometimes three and four times a day, we're more concerned with them walking the COVID-19 into the facility. And of course, once it's in the facility, it takes on a life of its own. So there's this continual worry and angst about what to do. How do, what do, how do we cope with this? And then, of course, what happens once it is here? And to date, uh, we, have, we have not had any positive cases here. Um, and the thing that ran through my mind as Manir and Storm were talking and something that's happened here with me as the chaplain dealing with these two populations who are in the same situation is a passage I remember from Matthew 9 in the New Testament Jesus is walking with his disciples past the blind man, and they ask him, who's to blame? And that's sort of what both populations here in my facility are asking. Who is to blame? Where did this come from? Who is to be held accountable? And what do we do about it? Um, and what I've encountered as the chaplain here is learning to listen and validate their experience, their sense of frustration, their sense of powerlessness, the patients who cannot leave, the staff who come in and some who've said they feel safe in here, but they're not safe once they leave here because now they're in the community, but they have to return back. Um, and the state of Maine, with while our governor has given this stay at home um, decree, we are a deemed essential personnel. So we have to come to our facility. We have to come and deal with the patients, most of whom who are already um, immunocompromised or who are already um, at risk physically and now they're at risk emotionally and they're picking up on our frustrations as well as our own tension 
So as chaplain, I've walked with both convert, both groups having to say to them, my own faith affirmation is no one to blame, but there are plenty of things that we can do to empower each other and to empower our staff and to listen. And as Storm said, to accompany them through their sense of helplessness, to remind them that they're not hopeless and that we as people of faith also are participants in this frustration, but we also are agents, as she said, of this change and the hope and to remind people that we are not helpless or hopeless, that we are always been a community. We've been distracted by so many things, and that's one thing that COVID-19 is doing, is forcing us back to our internal resources and our sense of community with one another and how we make things happen. So it's for me, it's empowering everyone, validating their experiences, listening to them, reminding them that they're not alone, that even when they go home to their families, they can still listen to them, but also to share with them, not out of a sense of powerlessness or victimization, but as a sense of community, that we are, as they've, as our governor said, we are all in this together, therefore we will come through this together. Therefore, we have to listen and validate each other's experiences and accompany each other. And as people of faith, we are also in this sense of frustration, but we also are participants with the hope. And so it's reminding ourselves. And um, I'm also a member of ABCOM, the American Baptist Churches here in Maine. And we are, as Manir said, we're going to more uh, televised experiences. Um, our executive director is speaking on Thursdays to the ministers who then are encouraged to talk to their congregations through the video to say that this is not a disconnect. This is not an abandoning of uh, of care this is um a recreating of care in another way uh yes to the 21st century but also in a way that we need to do anyway to people who are homebound without COVID, to people who are in hospitals without COVID, people who have been in restricted situations long before COVID. so we are adjusting to this new way of reaching to each other and I remember from pastoral care at CPE a long time ago, a supervisor told me pastoral care is past oral care. And how do we define ourselves as ministers, as people of faith, if we're not able to be with people physically? And that's what I think COVID is forcing us to do is to redefine that and to embody that in more expansive ways, not exclusionary ways. So it's reminding all of us and encouraging each of us in our communities of faith as well as within ourselves. As Manir said, we are people of faith, and the fact that we haven't been together doesn't mean we're not together. We just have to learn to be together more creatively, even as I've done here at our closed facility. And it, it is validated by the people who receive our care. Those are my few minutes. <laughs> Thank you, James. I'm glad we found you. Thanks for being with us. Your comments actually lead me to want to ask Thank a couple you. of questions. So first, I wonder for Absolutely. James and for, for any of you, have you encountered people who are not taking the virus seriously, who are buying into conspiracy theories? And if you have, or for those who are listening who have, how do you advise people, us, to respond? For me and my facility, um, so much of the mental health crises our patients are experiencing has an aspect of some sort of conspiratorial mindset. And it's to reassure them with the facts and to validate that the facts are the government did not create this. The government is not out to get you despite how it feels. And there has to be a way to listen to people as in validating what they feel without accusing them of being um, dramatically wrong is to be able to hear that. And as I've, I learned a long time ago, there's a grain of, of truth in what everyone is saying. Even in their conspiratorial thinking, they're saying they're afraid, they feel helpless, they feel victimized, and they feel that they're out of the loop of accurate information. So it's to learn to validate that and to steer them to main uh, cdcmain.gov and cdc.gov for as much accurate information as possible. That's what I do with our staff and our patients here. Mm -hmm. I would just say briefly that, um, you know, as the uh, spread has um, occurred and more people are impacted, I think the focus is on, you know, what can we do to minimize uh, the continued spread? 
uh, stretch it out and all that and you know hope for some medical interventions and, and really focus on that dimension of it the origin of the virus um, whether China should be blamed or some other entity should be blamed which might fall into some of the conspiratorial ideas um, you know uh, I've seen some of that on social media but not a whole lot and you know mostly you know I'd see the discussion is steered towards just dealing with the reality of what we need to do to protect as many people as possible, regardless of what people might think about where this came from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, another question that um, I was wondering Manier, about. Oh. Go for it. Oh, I was going to ask Manir. Have you experienced, like me, for me, my, it's, I'm finding that my staff and their frustration are bringing their thoughts from the community to our patients as if they have more access to information than our patients do, and thus they kind of feed that that atmosphere of fear and suspicion. Um, and I've found that guiding them back to the facts, back to as much accurate information kind of helps, but underneath that, I hear their frustration and their fear. Has that been your experience on your side as well? Well, in, in terms of our student body, I think uh, we don't, uh, ha we haven't been doing a whole lot of pastoral care. I mean, we've been asking them to rely on their local imams and resources, uh, but we we are a an outlet for them to express their concerns. Um, so I don't know if that same dynamic holds uh, in our case. I was going to okay. ask if we could get really practical just for a minute. And I know, Storm, you were talking about uh, burnout. And I wanted to ask all, all three of you, you know, what would you advise chaplains to do now to prevent burnout? Or what are the things that you are doing now uh, in your work that you're finding to be most empowering for those with whom you work? What What are the sort of practical things we could do now to to help address concerns that will come in the future? Storm? Oh, I was I, I think you cut off? There we go. There you go. <laughs> I think there's three things for me, and one of them is having a sense of agency, uh, as I said before, uh, and a sense of community, but also a sense of what is it that we can particularly offer in the midst of this. Um, and and what do I need to do to nurture myself? So that you know that sense of in a disaster, self care is not an option. Um, I think you know I, it seems like my days at the moment are one series of Zoom meetings after another. Uh, we're, we're in this webinar um, at one o'clock. I'm meeting with advisees. At two o'clock, there's a liturgy planning meeting, and at three o'clock, there's a chaplains. Um, uh, a group meeting and, and that kind of thing. So, uh, you know, in the midst of all that, I the other day I had a coffee hour with three of my dearest colleagues at the seminary that I can't see at the moment, but we just ha hung out and had coffee or tea or whatever for an hour. And that was so life-giving. So I think as we're, you know, looking at these you know these three spaces how how that holding space how do we create and recreate relationships and care in the midst of what's going on how do we attend to suffering uh, that you know enter into that suffering space but how do we find that transforming life-giving space as well and and if we don't have practices that are life-giving at the moment then I think we are more likely to tend towards burnout that we're just simply exhausted about being adaptive and doing things in new and different ways so I think for some of us it's finding those life-giving spiritual practices that have worked for us before or are part of our tradition. Um, for some of us, it's finding new practices. I think for me, what I've been um, uh, concentrating a lot, on, a lot on is finding embodied coping practices. And because this is a disaster that targets breath as much as anything, um, I've, uh, going back to those traditions of uh, self-calming, soothing, breathing practices have been helpful. So, 
breathe three, four, breathe in through your nose for a count of three, and then out for a count of four, making sure you breathe out for one count longer than you breathe in, because it activates the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, I think the some of the meditation practices, what I call using the middle finger, uh, doing breath meditation with your uh, using your middle finger, which tends to bring your breath down into your diaphragm uh, and and sitting with that. Um, I've turned to one of the practices that I was taught uh, in my son's preschool class, which was a, a, a method of coping, um, phys a physical practice, uh, which I won't do now, uh, but it was particularly for those that found anxiety and distress and just kids, some kids that would later be diagnosed with ADHD, whose energy was spilling out all over the place, finding some ways to center and come back into the body. And I think that speaks uh, particularly also to the importance of touch. I think for many people, particularly those on their own, you know, we need to be touched to have a sense of psychological well-being. And what happens when we don't get that touch in our daily lives? And some of some people face that on an, an ongoing basis anyway. But I think for many people, you know, not to share the peace physically, not to be physically around people, you know, to have some kind of um, touch. So how do we how do we care for ourselves in that way? Um, and, and for me, one of the most important things has been what I call socially locating prayer. Because with our memories, we often remember people in context. And in my tradition, often when we pray, we pray a name or, you know, call somebody to mind. But I, I, I think socially locating prayer where we pray for those closest to us in location, it may be our room, it may be our home, our apartment, our building, and then gradually going further and further out, touching on people we love or those for whom we're praying, you know, in our neighborhood, in our community, in our state, in our country, in the neighboring countries, until we get around the globe and pr pray for our planet that is in crisis. Um, I th that, that's been an important practice for me. And just one, one last thing, I have had a dear friend who's been very, very sick with uh, COVID-19. And one of the ways we have socially connected across a vast difference of states as she has been struggling for breath is um, she's been using the three, four breath practice. And every time I wake up in the night and think of her, I do three breaths with her as well. So just that sense of we are connected spiritually, even where, when we are socially uh, disconnected. Thank I you, Storm, that's really helpful. Uh, to, Sorry. Go ahead. I would, I would just say, you know, um, sometimes we do things in, in a checklist, kind of we wanna make sure the kids are fed, that, that they're uh, meeting online with their teachers or whatever the, the case may be in terms of their educational plan. Um, but in between those moments, the interstitial space of the checklist, I mean, really touch and hugging and sort of affirmation, being connected. I think uh, hopefully all of us are finding in our particular context, uh, whatever our social contexts are, that we're able to fill in not only the time, but the space. Um, in terms of time, yes, slowing down, I think has been very crucial. Um, even if it's just to stand on the porch or in the front yard or whatever space one might have uh, and just not do anything other than breathe and, and sort of reflect a little bit on where things stand and, and be grateful and recognize one's privilege if one has it and um, and just, you know, um, take that in and um, use that to uh, to chart a way forward. Mm -hmm. 
There are a number of questions in the in the question box, which until a few minutes ago appeared empty to me, I apologize to all of you, about anticipatory grief and staff in particular, also chaplains feeling like they're just waiting for this grief to come with these waves that are to come. Can any of you speak to uh, coping with anticipatory grief and or supporting staff? There's also quite a few questions about staff. Yeah, I, I've seen uh, different expressions um, emerge and, and different levels of reaction. You know, uh, I'm pretty particular. I'm, I'm a particularly stoic kind of individual, so I may not be as expressive, but um, certainly, you know, other members of our team are uh, display some anxiety or sense of isolation, loneliness, and um, we just talk it through. You know, we just. Uh, connect and have conversation, not just about the work, but about other things. And, uh, uh, you know, their, their good memories, past experiences, travels, things that lighten the mood a bit and, you know, take us away from a conversation about COVID. I think for me it's helpful to recognise the difference between anticipatory grief and um, acute grief. And, and to, I think with any of these models, we need to see them in a way that's descriptive rather than prescriptive. When I was at one of the um, family assistance centres, I heard one fairly green uh, mental health, uh, disaster mental health person saying to a family member, well, you're in shock and denial at the moment, but soon you're going to get angry and then you're going to bargain and you'll get depressed and then you'll finally accept what's happened. And not only were they inappropriately applying anticipatory grief to acute grief, I mean, it was just so dogmatic and um, a, a, particularly brutal form of education that was inappropriate in that context. I, I think, um, of course, that was citing Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of dying. And even with anticipatory grief, I find um, Carl Nyswanger's uh, uh, dramas of, of grief much more helpful than Kubler-Ross's stages. And we all know the critiques of stage theory. But Nice Wonga was the chaplain that worked with Kubler Ross, and he uh, talked about the drama of shock, denial versus panic, the drama of emotion, catharsis versus depression, the drama of negotiation, bargaining versus selling out, the drama of cognition, realistic hope versus despair, the drama of commitment, acceptance versus resignation and the drama of completion, fulfillment versus forlornness. Um, and I think that sense shows the spectrum of response and um, it helps us, you know, to, to listen deeply about where the staff members are in relation to grief. Uh, I find William Worden's tasks of grieving much more helpful in, in many different ways. But again, I come back to uh, one of the uh, most helpful questions and I think what has become a highly critiqued process of, of debriefing. Um, but one of the helpful questions is, what is the worst thing about this for you? So hearing what what is it actually that the person is uh, is most concerned about? What is it that they are grieving if they are grieving? Let alone where they are with that that journey of grief, because sometimes it's things that we don't anticipate hearing. Um, and I think you know part of this disaster is, is going to teach us again what it is to be chaplains what what is being called out of us and and I don't I'm not sure we know that at the moment so maybe Dykstra's model of the intimate stranger as we look into the strangeness of this disaster and how do we be present disembodied but present in a different way or how do we work with the level of anxiety in our communities 
I don't think we'll know until we're the other side what's really being called out called out of us and, and so part of it is how do we step into the unknown and be alongside whatever we hear, you know, with those good practices of, of care in the midst of this. Mm -hmm. Let me ask just one more question before we break and I see there are a number of questions I didn't, uh, wasn't able to get to. I would encourage you please join the private Facebook group and ask each other these questions because we don't have all the answers. The best we can do is to help you all be in conversation with one another. Um, so to conclude, I wonder if any of the three of you want to speak to how you see the role of chaplaincy transforming as we move through and out of this crisis, uh, particularly as related to grieving for individuals, for families, for communities, as, uh, for the nation. Thoughts about how, how you see the role of chaplains changing and shifting over time? I mean, I'll just say real quick, one, two things. I mean, one is the heightened uh, profile of disaster chaplaincy is something that I think will have to, you know, play out in terms of curriculum in a more significant way, probably. Um, it's not a course that we offer per se. Um, for example, we have various electives, but uh, I think this would be something to, to incorporate. Um, the second thing is I think just uh, chaplaincy services for frontline individuals, of course, it's always been there, but I think paying more attention to that is going to be crucial. Yeah, we have been a seminary that's offered a disaster uh, spiritual care course. And I think uh, what we've always done is start with the 1918 uh, Spanish flu pandemic. And I think um, that's been quite helpful for students and look, you know, at the time we were looking at the comparisons between that and the H1N1 virus. Um, but so again, uh, you know, giving space to teaching around uh, disaster chaplaincy and, and hearing um, the responses of others. I think uh, always coming back to care for staff that are particularly facing, you know, just unprecedented levels of stress. I know uh, staff in our hospital are just fried, those that are working at the coalface, because I think it's not just the level of care, but the physical constraints of that care and the different reality of that, uh, working with that personal protection equipment, you know, not just, uh, you know, the whole shift in some, uh, some ways, feeling under threat yourself. Um, and, uh, and I think again, coming back to those um, uh, practices that, you know, learning them anew in different contexts. So I think the shape of chaplaincy, we, we've always associated, I think, with a physical ministry of presence. And so how does that expand as we offer uh, a virtual ministry of presence or a ministry of presence and in those adaptive ways that we're, we're having to do so. James, you want to have the last word? Sounds like we've lost him again. So uh, we will send uh, any follow-up material that was mentioned here that Munir and Storm could share with us with the webinar. Munir, lots of people are asking for your poem and Storm, people are interested in a number of the articles and things that you've mentioned. So if you could share those with us, we will pass them on. Uh, we're doing a second webinar this week for folks on Thursday at 1.30 p.m. Boston time, distant funerals, complicated grief, gathering to grieve during COVID-19. Zach Willett of LA Care Services will moderate this conversation with Alawa Arthur, who is with Going With Grace, Rabbi Steve Kay of the American Red Cross Disaster Spiritual Care, Casper Chokuli of the Sacred Design Lab, who has a wonderful new book about uh, designing ritual, Glenda Stansbury, a licensed funeral home director, and Perla Torres with the Colbury Center for Human Rights. So thanks again uh, to Storm, to James, to Munir. We're really grateful to you. Thanks to everyone who is with us and for your patience with our Q&A troubles. Uh, we will send the recording out and we hope to see you again soon on Thursday if, or next week. We'll continue, as you know, these Tuesday check-ins uh, for as long as needed as we work our way through this together. Thank you, thank, thank you, thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you to all of you on the front lines. You all, everyone.